focusing on NIST, DFARS, and ITAR or export control considerations. Um, I wander when I talk, so just, you know, I hope everybody can see me okay so I'm not up there on the, uh, on the, uh, on the stage, but um, I will walk around. I, I'm happy to answer questions as we're going through the session. Um, that usually makes it flow a little bit better. I do have a, a, a slide at the end where we can you know, stop and take questions if you'd like to do it that way. Um, but I'm happy to take questions during the session if you have them. Just you know, raise your hand and, and, and we'll go right into questions. And uh, we only do only have 45 minutes though. I've got about 20 slides, so we are going to be moving a little bit quicker than I would like. Um, I could do an hour and a half to two hours with this slide set. Um, so there is, uh, there's a lot here that we can talk about, okay? You can see the outline, what we're going to go through today. I'm going to hit um, a little bit of an introduction of myself, some architecture terminology, because I want to make sure everybody in here understands some very basic terms that I'm going to go through. I would say that this is a, this is a 100 to 200 level session okay, on compliance in the cloud. We're not going to go into a lot of technical detail in this session. We're going to really talk about compliance from a conceptual standpoint and cloud platforms at a conceptual level. Okay. Uh, we're going to go over some, some specifics around DFAR, CUI, and export compliance. We're going to talk about FedRAMP, which is really important. Um, and then we're going to go through some specifics about three of the leading cloud vendors out there and how you can or maybe cannot become compliant on different components of their platform. And then finally, we're going to talk about some, uh, some, some future DOD thoughts about, uh, are you, all of you familiar or have heard of uh, the JEDI contract? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to go into a Q&A period. How are you doing, Rodney? Good to see you. Doing good, Scott. Better be good. All right, we'll see, we'll see. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in. So introduction-wise, my name is Scott Edwards, uh, president of Summit 7, managing partner. Um, I have been in the Microsoft ecosystem for a little over 20 years now. Um, my background is um, I was military, then I went to work at NASA, where I worked, uh, worked with a few people in here, actually. Uh, so it's glad, I'm glad to see all you guys. Uh, so I worked at NASA for a while. I got my master's degree in information security from James Madison University as well. And uh, then I started Summit 7 about 11 years ago. So I've been doing specifically this kind of work in the consulting space for about 11 years. Um, for the last, I would say, three or four years, I've been uh, focused heavily in the security and compliance space on the Microsoft platform, dealing with things like the DFAR 7012 rule, uh, NIST 800-171, ITAR, EAR, export compliance, those kinds of issues specifically around the Microsoft platform, okay? That's my contact information. Please feel free if you have any questions afterwards, email me. Um, if you need my cell phone, it's right there. I can give you a card afterwards if you want, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, after the session, okay? All right, so first thing I want to do is I want to get a baseline. Um, most of you in here, in fact, I would say probably 95% of you in here are going to know all this terminology already, but I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page, okay? So some cloud architecture terminology I want to throw out there. Uh, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service, okay? Um, I've got a slide here in just a second where I'm going to go over what is each one of those, but I'm going to be using those terms a lot in how we uh, define and how we segment different types of architectures in the cloud, okay? Um, we've got cloud environments, we've got hybrid cloud, and we have on-premises or private cloud, okay? Cloud is just a fancy term for somebody else's computer, right? But these terms have very specific meanings in our industry. Uh, cloud, typically people are talking about public cloud, and when I say public cloud, that is a utility-like capability um, the main, main vendors out there today are Amazon, Microsoft with their Azure service, and then Google with their Google Cloud Platform. Those are three of the leading vendors out there. There's also some other ones like Alibaba. There's a ton of other providers out there, but they're not really, really big in most cases. All right? Then you have hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud is where you have on-premises solutions also connected to um, also connected to cloud-based solutions, working as a seamless or as a single entity, okay? So that's hybrid cloud. And then on-premises, or in some cases you also hear it called private cloud environments, essentially is the traditional data center, um, unless you're talking about a solution like an Azure Stack. How many of you have heard of Azure Stack before? Okay, a few of you. So Azure Stack is essentially Microsoft has boxed the Azure platform capability into um, a Connex, 
or you can bring that Azure platform on premises, or you can deploy it out with the military, and you have essentially the Azure cloud on premises. Okay, um, so that is uh, that is a uh, a way to do um, cloud um, in an on-premises manner. All right. So these are some terms that we're going to be talking about as we go through these slides. So the cloud market is booming. I don't think that is um, news to anybody in here. Okay, everybody is going cloud. Um, DoD contractors and the DoD in general have been slower to adopt, but the pace of adoption of cloud technologies has exploded in the last 18 to 24 months. Okay, um, up until about 24 months ago, if I talked to a DoD contractor about cloud technologies, they basically were like this. Okay, they didn't want anything to do with it. They were like, you know, they. I've got my environment, I've got it firewalled, I have a team of people running it, it's, it's secure, I know it's secure, and then we continue to have breaches and breaches and breaches, and then they start, their, their confidence is shaking, can my team really handle this? And then you have the compliance requirements that have been laid down, DFARS, et cetera, and, and all these companies are looking at this and say, this is way too much, I can't do this anymore. I cannot continue to fund, I cannot continue to put the staffing in place for me to run these systems the way I need to run them to be both secure and compliant. And so they're pushing everything to the cloud as fast as they can. Um, it has been an, an overnight change almost among most companies, very, very big. So you can see here, 2018, 181 billion dollars spent in cloud services in 2018. You can see that is going to almost double by 2022 to 330 billion. You can see here when people talk about public cloud and, uh, and everybody talks about public cloud market share and who are the biggest vendors out there, et cetera, et cetera, most people are looking at the statistics specifically about, and I'm going to see if this works, this line right here, this green line, that is the one that most people are looking at. And that is your IaaS or infrastructure as a service platform, the Amazon Web Services IaaS platform versus the Azure platform versus the Google Cloud platform. That's the number that everybody used for cloud market share. Everybody, for some reason, ignores this black line. And I don't know why they do. This is your SaaS platforms. These are your software as a service platforms. This is your Salesforce. This is your Office 365. This is your G Suite. These are all these cloud services that are being offered by these companies is a huge, huge market. I mean, it's much bigger than your cloud platform from an IS standpoint out there, okay? So you really have to take that in consideration when you start talking about the revenue that's out there in the cloud services world. And you can see that both IaaS and SaaS are growing at an enormous rate, okay, from a year-over-year uh, -year standpoint. These numbers are uh, from Gartner in April of this year, okay? So when we talk about market share, um, this market share numbers, you cannot find market share numbers that talk specifically about SaaS. Okay, for some reason, everybody that does these numbers, they're not interested in the SaaS market share. These are the infrastructure as a service market share numbers. Okay, Amazon is leading in the infrastructure as a service market. They've got roughly 47% of the market right now. That market, that number is, 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 is um, dropping. Okay, Microsoft and, um, and others are picking up and are taking market share from Amazon on a consistent basis. And you can go out and you can find half a dozen different um, you know, uh, graphs like this, and all six of them will be different. They'll all say something different because it's all about how you slice that pie and how you determine who has what. Yeah. Scott, is that worldwide or match? Uh, this, this is worldwide. This is worldwide because you see here, number four, yeah. Alibaba. Alibaba. Okay, Alibaba being number four. Um, Amazon, Amazon at 47, Microsoft at 22, Google at 7, Alibaba at 8, and then all the other vendors, your Oracles, your IBMs, all those other guys are kind of lumped into that 16% that's left over there, okay? Um, so it is a, it's a big market, but it's really, really dominated by Microsoft and Amazon, okay? Those are the two leading, part, uh, leading providers by far. Okay, so now that we've gotten some, some baseline cloud stuff out there, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some baseline compliance uh, knowledge, okay? So, when we talk about putting um, security and compliance in place, there's four things that you really have to take into consideration. The first one is you have to have the right corporate technology policies. If you don't have the right corporate technology policies in place, it doesn't matter what you do from a, from a platform standpoint, you're not going to be in a compliant environment because all the policies and how people interact with that system is not going to be compliant. Okay? So you have to have a set of policies that help you drive that, both from a technology standpoint, but also from a security standpoint. Can you bring your own device to work? Do you take your laptop home? 
can you go um, connect to your environment from an internet cafe okay, or, or a public Wi-Fi device? All of those kinds of policies are very important that you have to lay down um, you know, to help you define your um, IT uh, environment, IT systems. So after you have your policy sets um, done, and there's many, many people here, and there's some great companies that work out there that are out there in the, in the, um, um, in the exhibit hall that do specifically focus on policy. Um, some that we work with, Mad Security is out there, they do a great job. Centaur is out there, they do a great job. So we have lots of great companies here that really focus very heavily on that policy component and it's super, super important. Um, so go see one of those guys if you, need those kind of help, if you need that kind of help. The third piece is this functional, technical, and 800-171 compliance requirement. So if you're looking to be DFARS compliant, you have to meet the NIST 800-171 com um, control set, right? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes, but whatever that control set is that you're looking to meet, you have to have those as a baseline requirement for, from a technical standpoint. But it, that's not all that you have to have. You have to also have your functional and your business requirements. Okay? Your technical and your business requirements have to be part of that because it doesn't, make, it, it doesn't help if you have all of your compliance pieces there, but you haven't taken any consideration how your business runs. You've got to understand how your business runs and build those same requirements into the system as well. Okay? And then the last piece is your chosen platform capabilities. So if you have your policies in place and you have your functional, technical, and 800-171 compliance requirements in place and you know what those are and you know what you need to do to build to them, but you pick a platform that is not capable of meeting the requirements that you've identified, then you failed, right? You can't get there. You have to have all four pieces and you cannot get to a compliant platform until all four of these pieces are working together and are integrated and, and is all part of a single project or a single rollout. Okay? No. Yeah. Just as a question, when I see 800-171, I think of that as a government regulation, correct? It is a government set of controls that de defines what a contractor must do to secure government information. So when I also go back now to your talk where you're talking about corporate technology policy, mm -hmm. if I hear you right and apply what you're saying, I think you're saying your company needs to do these things if you want to do business with the government. All four of these. That's part of it. That's part of it. You have to have corporate technology policies just for how you are going to use um, technology, regardless of what you're doing for the government. But if you have that government requirement, that's going to drive some of those technology policies as well. Okay? All right. So how, do you go, how are you going to approach compliance? So you know you have to do these things. Um, so there's a number of different ways that you can approach that compliance. You can decide, okay, I'm going to build my walled garden. I'm going to put up you know, huge walls around my IT environment, and I'm going to do it all on-premises. I'm going to build in my entire environment. And so when I do that, I'm responsible for everything in these, all these blue boxes. Okay? I'm responsible for my physical data center, my network, my systems, my OS, my network controls, all the way up the OSI stack. Okay? I'm responsible for it. If you decide that you're going to build it in an um, Amazon Web Services or a Microsoft Azure environment, then you're looking at IaaS and PaaS, depending on the specific services. Okay? So that's less that you have to deal with from a compliance standpoint because the provider is doing some of those things for you. Okay? By leveraging the capabilities that provider is giving you, you have less that you have to worry about as the actual data owner. As the system owner, you don't have to worry about quite as much. And then finally, from a SaaS standpoint, a software as a service standpoint, so if you move into, say, an Office 365, uh, a G Suite, or some other kind of SaaS platform, uh, uh, um, a Salesforce, a Dell Tech Cloud, something like that, that is a SaaS platform, you really are only responsible for the user identi um, identity, the account and access management, your endpoints, and then your data governance, the only ownership of the data itself. Everything else is done by the provider. The network, the OS, the physical host, all of that is handled by the provider. Okay? Um, so you have to decide, you as a company, how, are you, where are you comfortable? Okay? What, how much do you want to outsource? What risk do you want to move to someone else?